scrutiny or less. And I can see, hi, Meredith, that you've come in and joined us. So we've gone in and started without you, but I'm going to cover the first part, and then I'm going to pitch it to you to do the interview. How'd that sound? That sounds great. Sorry, I apologize. I had a problem with my link. Yeah, me too, actually. Oh, did oh. you too? Okay, great. I did. It's not me. I did. No, it's not just you. So backing up to the start of the program, this is Red Flags, Green Lights. And I'm going to start with this parallel to the CPAs who do audits. There are three things that we look for to decide whether fraud may be more likely or less likely. And I'll tell you what, the first one is one that is almost always in play if you are a lender, an underwriter, or an analyst for a lending um, institution. And that first one is, do they have the ability to provide us misinformation? Now in an audited statement where there are internal controls and there's separation of duties and there's all kinds of things in play that may reduce the likelihood that they even could get away with getting us bad information. Fact is, if you're lending to a small business, the business owner is giving you the financial statements. They're giving you the tax returns. And frankly, anybody can get their hands on QuickBooks or TurboTax and kick out something that actually looks real. So the first of the three possibilities, and that is they can give you misinformation, frankly, that's probably in play for you already. Uh, Linda, I would, I would really um, agree with that. I think often, too, our customers don't even realize it's fraudulent um, information. I mean, I remember back when I was a um, customer service rep way back in the day opening accounts, and you would have people come in and give you social security cards that they had bought and paid for, and they didn't realize they weren't valid social security cards. Um, now our systems, you know, check systems and things figures that out. But I think it's the same. People assume because they have information that they put into QuickBooks, a lot of times they'll come in and they may believe that that information um, is accurate and it may not be. And the other is that sometimes they're giving you information and it's not accurate. That's right. That's right. So because we already have that one in play, now we need to go to the next one. And the next one starts to filter for us, thankfully. The second one is what we call need or greed. How desperate are they for this loan? Are you the fifth lender they've gone to or the first? <laughs> uh, and it's not just need, it is greed. So sometimes you don't really think they need a third vote, but apparently they feel strongly that they need that third vote. I'll give you an example. My husband and I bought a new car last month, as a matter of fact, having a great time with it. Uh, we pay cash for it and we had the cash to pay for it and yet the salesperson said you know are you interested in financing well I went ahead and asked about the terms just in case I was really attracted by that but because we didn't even need the loan that reduced the likelihood that we would lie to get the loan so as a lender credit analyst underwriter their desperation well, increase the chances that they will provide you with that information. I'm going to ask everybody to figure out how to uh, how to mute the call because there's some sound in the background. So Linda, how do you, Linda, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What do you, with with need or greed? When somebody's sitting in front of you, I mean, there you and your husband are buying a card. You don't you don't you don't need it. Is there, are there, are, is there anything that you should be looking for to, I mean, to determine that? Well, some of, uh, actually this pops right back to some of Tracy's recommendations yeah. last time. And that is that if they're ev expressing evidence physically of lying, that starts making you guess how desperate they are. But also you can see in their credit report, how many hits there have been to their credit report as an example. Okay. Right. And, you can, and you simply can ask the question, is, is this, you know, if you're talking about a business loan and they've been banking with you for a long time and you already have all their loans, that's one thing. If they're new to you or to your bank, asking a little bit about their previous experience yeah. with their other bank might be yeah. a reasonable thing to do. So there's number two, need or greed. Then, then we come to number three. And this is where the way the auditors see fraud really collides nicely with the way bankers look at credit. And so I'm actually going to uh, go to the chat here and I'm going to ask you guys that are on this call, if you've ever heard of the five C's of credit or the six C's of credit or maybe the three C's of credit, would you type into the chat what's at least one of those C's of credit, which are the 
filter that lenders and banking professionals use to decide whether to make a loan. So I'm going to take a look at that chat. I've got character, 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 uh, capacity. Thank you for that other one. There's some others as well. So let's pick some other, some other than character. I've got collateral capacity. Absolutely. I would add in conditions, but as you can see, a lot of the people on the call, they are familiar with the C's of credit. Well, character was the one that was mentioned the most it is what i think of as the filter with the smallest holes if they can't make it through that one they can't maybe make it through the other ones or even if they could if i think they're lying i'm not interested and how that collides with this third way that auditors look at it is are they likely to lie to you is it in their character to do so so let me hit this one a little bit harder because this is really the key. We all know people who have the ability to mislead us, who may be actually in desperate straits and they simply would never lie to get the loan. It's not what they do. So what does this character piece mean and how does a lender assess character? Once I talk about that, then I will give you some of those specific red flags that I think might be indicators. I want to hit this a little harder because I thought this was really clear and I was doing a program on red flags and green lights at a business lending summit this year. And one of the people in the audience raised his hand. He says, I got an example for you. I just want to run it past you. He was an experienced lender, but back when he was learning his mentor lender had shown him what he does with tax returns. He looks at schedule a itemized deduction, and he says, you know, if they're making a lot of charitable contributions, that's a good indicator of uh, character. And that would be a real plus. So I'm going to go back to chat and ask people in this session, do you think that whether or not you make charitable contributions is the kind of indication of character that you're looking for, or does character mean something different to you? So yes or no? Yes, we would look at the, the, look at the charitable contributions as an indicator or no. And I've got three so far. I'll wait for a few more. All right. So you guys are all on my same page. Here's the deal. Character when it comes to the C's of credit and when it comes to that third way that auditors look at the likelihood of fraud really relates to will they pay if they possibly can? Could I do this deal on a handshake? Um, is their word their bond? That's what we're looking for. Because if that is true and we're comfortable with that, then all the financial information and the other issues start bubbling up as the most important thing. And frankly, if they have evidence that they will lie to us for financial gain, then the rest of them may not be that important because we really don't want to say yes to a, a, a loan that we really cannot trust the information. Where that puts us next then is what would be a red flag about character? And I'm going to give you two, and then I'm going to give you how those might actually be a green light instead. Because I want you to spot a red flag, not to decide it's a deal killer right off, but to get your attention and have you stop and thinking. It's a little bit like the video last week with Tracy talking about body language, but the first indicator might be not be a problem, but if you see two things or three things all at once, you need to get your attention on, hmm, I wonder if we have accurate information here. So have you ever had a lender hand you their tax returns and they said to you, here's my tax returns, but it's, it's really not what I make. I'll watch the chat for this one. Anybody ever had any potential borrower give them a tax return and then say, but that's not really what I make? Now, I'm not seeing answers yet, and I'm just wondering if that's because you don't actually want to admit it. Oh, here we come. And Jennifer Jennings uh, says, you, yeah, usually with cash businesses, cash businesses rather, and certainly if it's a cash business like uh, some retail restaurants and so forth, they may tell you all about the credit parts of it and maybe start playing around with the cash. I'm looking at some other ones too, and Michael, thank you for saying taxable income does not equal cash flow. That's a whole different issue of how you calculate cash flow. But the first issue for me, and again, would you please 
check and see. I think it's Sharon. I think you might need to mute your um, microphone. If you will. <laughs> and then Rosary saying most people are more afraid of the IRS than they are of lenders. Okay, so here's the deal. The red flag part, of course, is that if they really are coming out and bragging to you how, yeah, you know, we, we file the tax return, but, you know, we don't, we don't pay for our personal cars at all, and we do all this travel, and you really shouldn't count a bunch of this because it's just write-offs for taxes, but it's not really our business. They have just absolutely told you that they're willing to misrepresent financial information to a third party, the Internal Revenue Service, to pay less taxes. That's a problem. If, in fact, they are lying to the IRS in significant ways and underpaying their taxes with knowledge. And again, I'm going to ask everybody to try to mute your phone. And Meredith, since you're the manager of this meeting, perhaps you can mute other people yourself. I'm not sure. Yes, I will go in and see if I um, see if I can see if I can make that happen. I appreciate it. All right, so here, so that's the red flag. But folks, there are perfectly legitimate reasons why a tax return will not reflect their income. And Michael spoke to one of them, and that is that taxable income is not the same as cash flow available to pay debt and to pay the owners. So sometimes they're looking at that tax return. This gets a little bit back to what Meredith said as we started up. They're looking at the tax return and they just, they don't really understand tax returns. They're just saying, hey, this isn't, you know, this isn't what my business looks like. This can happen, for example, when it's cash basis tax returns, but accrual basis financial statements. Maybe they have been looking at those financial statements uh, and then they looked at the tax returns. They know they're different. The financial statements seem to more reflect how they're doing, but you ask for the tax returns. So they're just saying, here's the tax returns, but it doesn't really show. It doesn't show the big projects we finished right at the end of the year. We build them out. I can show you the contracts. Uh, we'll get the money in January, but because of the way the CPA does the taxes, it's not there. So just be aware that when they say, here's my tax returns, it's not really what I made, they may be coming right out and telling you that they lie to the IRS. That's possible. But they also may simply be saying, this doesn't reflect it and let me tell you why. And I've had that experience myself. I get, for the training that I do with banks and credit unions around the country, I get a 50% deposit on the um, contract when I sign it. So normally at the end of the year, I'll have contracts on some programs that are happening the following year. This one particular year, though, I signed to do a bunch of work for a banking association and had a lot more in deposits that year at the end. Well, cash basis, that year looked way better than the year before, right? If everything else was the same except I had more deposits in hand, that one looks up, which, of course, is good for me. The lender might just look at those numbers and go, look, business is up. Great. I'm comfortable with this. But what happened the next year? The next year, if my deposits went down to the normal amount, then actually I've got the year, one year here, one up here, this one down. I don't know if you can see my hand if it's far enough down. One way for far down, and I couldn't help but uh, expect that a lender would look at that and either say, whoa, business is down, that's a problem, or look at how volatile this business is. They're all over the place. And that would be true even if my business was stable or growing, but growing in some moderate, sustainable way, you get those tax returns. And hopefully as lenders, underwriters, analysts, you do understand that what's on those returns, that bottom line doesn't reflect their cash flow. But the borrowers, small business borrowers, don't necessarily understand how it works. So they very well may say, here's what I got. Tracy, did you have something you wanted to add? Yep, we got to, well... I don't know if I have anything I want to add, but we do have a good chat question here. Right. Um, can we rely on a uh, schedule M one and two to reconcile the difference between tax returns and income reported on the books? So the answer is yes. And that's a little more technical question. So if you don't even answer, understand the question, don't worry about not understanding my answer. Um, but that will reconcile the two, but really lenders, underwriters, analysts don't always have the knowledge to understand what they're seeing there. So if you are familiar with that process, 
yes, it will tell you the differences, and one might be cash versus accrual. But by the way, that only reconciles with the financial statements. It still doesn't turn anything into cash flow available to pay debt or pay the owners. You have to be able to do that work. Um, and Michael says G-I-G-O, which I'm sure means something that I should understand because it's an acronym. <laughs> Is that good to go? No. Michael, chat in what you just meant by that because I just... I'm going to be old school and don't know. <laughs> I should have guessed that. Garbage in, garbage out. That is true. So let me address that one too, Michael. Red flag, green light. It is a red flag. And one of the best red flags, frankly, and so this is a good time to bring it up. One of the best red flags on the financial side is when things don't fit together and you can't come up with a good reason why not. So the fact that the financial statements and the tax returns are different could be a red flag unless those reconciliation pieces in M1 make sense to you. However, sometimes people will provide you with information, and actually Meredith said this at the front too, it, garbage in, garbage out. If their accounting is garbage because they don't know how to run QuickBooks or whatever tool they have, then it's gonna create financial statements, and here's the scary part, they're gonna look real. They're going to look real. You hit that report button and it's going to print something out and the balance sheet will balance and the income statement will go with the balance sheet. It will look real whether it's real or not. Same thing with the tax returns. You can use TurboTax or any other simple software. You can kick out a tax return and whether it's right or not is different though than whether it's fraudulent or not. And I think we should make that distinction simply because of the topic we're talking about today. Fraudulent means they've intentionally provided you information that is false with an attempt to get the loan. That is a different thing than they are unclear about how to do it, they didn't realize that in QuickBooks before they gave you the report, they should make sure that the bank statement balances to the cash balances and that the inventory somehow ties in to what they really have and that the accounts receivable number does tie back to a list of the people that owe them money. That's incompetence, but that's not fraud. That said, if we are relying on financial information to make a loan decision, one red flag would simply be these numbers don't look right. I've actually even seen a S Corp tax return where the balance sheet was not in balance. <laughs> that was actually the third problem. The first <laughs> problem was I got two years, and this is a good example of how your red flags ought to just, just be jumping up all over. I got two years tax returns. S Corporation that has a little restaurant. Uh, own 50% by, by uh, husband and wife, so 100% between them, 50% each. I did the first year, I did the numbers, and because I always use tax returns more like a financial statement as well, I looked at the cost of goods sold percentage and asked myself, does that make sense for a small restaurant, and sort of looked at the rest of the expenses. And in the tax return analysis training that I do, we always do a snapshot of a business to get a feel for it before we jump in and, and try to determine cash flow available to pay debt and pay the owners. Well, so that first year, it looked about right, and I came up with a cash flow figure. I go back to the year before, and in the year before, they had no cost of goods sold. Remind you, this is a restaurant, no cost of goods sold. It's sort of like it's a new restaurant, it's called a diet restaurant. <laughs> and you order and you pay them money, you don't eat anything, because they don't actually have anything. So you lose weight, you know, they make money. It's like, that didn't make any sense, right? This is a red flag, this is a red flag. And let me just pause and say, you won't notice it if you're not actually looking at those financial documents. If you're just throwing numbers into software and letting it give you an answer, you won't notice that the restaurant doesn't have cost of it sold. So at that point, I went back and found the cost of goods sold schedule, and there it was. And in fact, the amount was about right. So I'm thinking, okay, if it's on the schedule, where the heck did it go on the front page? So I went back to the front page and I found it. It was on the depreciation line. They had written their cost of goods sold in on the depreciation line. Now the lenders, underwriters, analysts on the call, would you please chat in what you plan to do with depreciation in a cash flow analysis? 
What do you do with depreciation when you're doing analysis of, ca uh, analysis of cash flow on a financial statement or tax return? And I know some of you know this answer. Absolutely. It is non-cash, we add it back. So notice, if you had not been paying enough attention, not only would you not notice the red flag, but you would add back their entire cost of goods sold for the year. You would get an answer that makes no sense at all, and I'm gonna suggest that if you miss the first two red flags, you won't even notice that the answer doesn't make sense. So I would say that's another red flag, and that is that, um, you need to make sure that when you get an answer, you pause and you just say, okay, does that answer make sense for what I just did? And by the way, one of you is also mentioning there's amortization. There's a whole set of non-cash items. And actually, I'll, I'll give you another opportunity that um, it's on my LendersOnlineTraining.com site. I'll go ahead and type it in. Actually, Meredith, if you type that in, LendersOnlineTraining.com for, forward slash free. One of the four, five free modules, one's on balance sheets, one's on corporations, I think, but one of them is called Green Legos, Six Ends, and a Map to Tax Return Analysis. And that actually is the one that will give you a lot of examples of the non-cash, the non-recurring, the amortization, depreciation, capital gains. We'll talk about all of those. And it's a short module. So I recommend that for you as well. So red flags we've done so far are it is the forward slash, Meredith. Uh, red flags we've done so far is tax return doesn't match the financial statements, but again, there are some legitimate reasons for that. Cash versus accrual certainly is one of them. They also handle depreciation differently. They handle inventory differently. So the fact that it is different doesn't mean we have a problem, but if you notice it, you might see if you can resolve that issue. The fact that they tell you the tax return doesn't represent their um, financial experience could be a red flag if what they're doing is coming right out and saying you know yeah we filed that tax return but here's what really goes on and they're telling you that they think it's a perk of business to write personal stuff off on their on their business return as soon as you know that they will lie to a third party for financial gain they have just flunked the character test because they will do it to you too um, another red flag is um, that, oh, let's see, I just forgot the red flag I was going to tell you. So this is where the train <laughs> left the station without me. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Michael's grinning because he's also a trainer. It's happened to him as well. So um, red flags that should get your attention. I think another one would be uh, taxes are too low for the wages they have. Now that might surprise you, but taxes have to be at least 10% of business wages. And wages don't include guaranteed payments or withdrawals by the owners, but do include compensation to the owners in the form of wages and, of course, wages for all their employees. Why is that? Because that would cover payroll taxes. Now, I'm not saying it's fraudulent that they're too low, but I will tell you that if they can't afford to pay their payroll taxes, I'm a little concerned about the status of their business. So that falls more into the red flags that indicate it's not a good credit risk as opposed to potentially the red flags that indicate that they're actually intending to provide fraudulent information. Let me throw one more to you and then I'm gonna pass this to Meredith because we're just about out of time together and the next one I wanna hit has to do with conversations and that's gonna be her topic next week. We talked last time with Tracy about if you suspect an issue with lying, one of the things you can do is start asking more questions. She talked about baseline questions to sort of get a feel for what their normal is so that you can start seeing when they shift out of it. Same idea here. If you do start to see that there's something in the financial statement or the tax returns or any of the myriad of information you have, keep in mind that once you start lying, it's hard to remember all the places you did lie and how you did. So what if you were to ask them a question that you actually know the answer to? And see if their answer, but, but wouldn't be a comfortable one for them to give. See if their answer does, it is credible. Give you a good example. We just did a, a refi on a rental property last year. My husband and I did. And, you know, he's got a business. I've got a business. Mine is an S corporation. We're real estate investors. So we actually do have a tax return set that tends to 
be a challenge for most lenders, but certainly mortgage lenders. And so um, they spotted that the bottom line of my tax return had dropped. Now here's what's interesting, because it's an exact example of what I've been talking about. First thing they did is they, uh, it was a whole digital deal, and so we had uploaded everything. They see the drop on my business, bottom line, and they asked me to please um, provide a letter explaining the decline in my business. So this is gonna bring me to the last way that you, you as a lender, underwriter, or analyst can really goof this up. And that, it's, it's a bias that we all have. It's not about gender, it's not about race, it's not about skin color, it's not about religion or politics. It is called confirmation bias. As soon as you get in your head that this is a problem loan, then your brain chemicals go to work and you will find everything that supports that and you will start missing any signs that don't. It's called heuristic thinking, it's called confirmation bias, auditors, CPAs, watch for this carefully. So I'm gonna ask you to be very cautious when you see a red flag, don't use, even in your mind, don't use words like decline in the business or problem loan or problem. If I see a red flag, my first thought, but I have to work on this, I've schooled myself to do it. My first thought is, wow, that's interesting. I should know more about that. Very, very neutral. I can promise you that as soon as this, whoever this was that was asking the question, I'm gonna guess it's the underwriter, as soon as they use the word decline in their head, decline a business, does that sound like a good thing or a bad thing? I think it sounds like a bad thing. What they could have said was the drop in net profit, even that would be more descriptive than it would be, you know, putting a value judgment on it. Now, so that you know that my business is doing fine, what had happened is that when we recovered from the recession, we had put off updating the website and pulling an instructional designer in to relook at all of our modules and pulling a graphic designer in to redo the manual. So the two years they happened to look at, the second one was when I was comfortable enough that everything was doing so well and we had excess liquidity that we went back and did a bunch of contracted services to bring everything else up to speed. It wasn't normal operations. It was something you do every five, seven, 10 years. But it, I had the money I had the revenue, revenue was holding, it hadn't dropped, and so I explained it. Now, here's where what I said really benefited me if that underwriter's familiar with what we're talking about here. Because what I told him was about the contracted services, what I just told you, but then I also said in addition to that, I have taken a half-time employee and she's now full-time, so that part of it will continue. So I've just told the lender something that actually could be a negative for me if they were concerned about it. When you are asking questions and you ask a question that the answer, as far as you could tell, might be a negative for them and they are honest and forthright with it, you may have a concern about why you asked the question, but you just have gotten some indication that you have a borrower who's probably gonna deal with you pretty straightly and answer your questions. And be more likely than not honest. And that's what we're looking for today as we talk about the red flags, green lights, don't get your signals crossed. So my takeaway here is be aware of confirmation bias. Be careful how you're saying these things because it is telling your brain what to look for. For red flags related to fraud, Start then looking at other things. So if you see one thing that's wrong on the financial statement of the tax return, look at some other things and then ask some questions. I had one tax return, great example to wrap it up. Uh, this was a photography studio, new client to, my, to me back when I had a tax practice. And this guy's writing off 80% of his airplane. Now when I first thought, saw that, I hadn't schooled myself yet. My first thought was, oh, come on because I wasn't as clear on confirmation bias as I am now. It just looked fishy, 80% of his airplane for a photography studio, and I don't think so. But thankfully, the way I asked the question was, um, could you tell me a little bit about how you use the airplane in your business? It was a totally neutral question, 
And boy, was I glad I asked it that way because it turned out the guy did not have a photography studio. His company was an aerial photographer. <laughs> they flew around taking pictures. So it's a really good example that something that at first blush can look like a problem. I have no problem with you calling it a red flag if what you mean by that is you need more information. And if you can determine that a way to ask the question or get the information that still tells you that they're honest with you and maybe resolves the issue, then you may be able to take what looked like a no for there for a moment and someone who had less knowledge about red flags and fraud and analysis would decline that loan, but you can spot that in fact, this is, may not be a problem. And I may be able to get the information to actually say yes, do the deal and do it well and do a loan that will be performing and keep a relationship that is a valuable relationship. That is where I wanna pitch this to Meredith because next week she's doing something on conversations. But before I do, Tracy, do we have any other questions that you wanna pitch me? We have one, it's a little bit technical. Um, and this is from Vanny, who I think we can count on for technical um, questions. Uh, let's see, so if we use spreading software to spread uh, three, hang on, three year in tax returns, but the interim is um, company prepared financials. Will the resultant UCA cash flows create uh, incomparable trends for sound credit decisions? Uh, TR versus uh, company prepared FS. If so, how do we mitigate? Vanny, wow. <laughs> I love that question, Vanny. I love it. So uh, you're, you're right to understand that whenever you mix it up, so if you're using tax returns and then financial statements, whether it's three years and the financial statements in the middle, or what's more common is you got two years tax returns. Here we are, it's already in 2017, but they haven't filed their 2016 yet. So you're gonna ask for 2016 financial statement to go with your 15 and 14 tax returns. So a couple things. One is be sure to notice whether one is cash basis and the other is accrual. Because if that's the case, then you can double count income or you can completely leave it out as we have that shift between. So I would say with your example, Vanny, if all three are accrual basis, then I'd be less concerned with uh, losing income or adding income or expenses. If they are not, and you know how to convert an accrual basis statement to cash, which you can do if you've got the balance sheets, that might be a step to take. Or the third possibility is that even with that spread, that the loan looks good enough, the loan to value, the collateral, and so forth, that perhaps in your write-up you acknowledge that you've mixed tax returns and financial statements, but believe that you've still gotten the information necessary to support recurring cash flow available to pay debt and pay the owners. Does that help, Benny? Uh, what if income per tax return company prepared FS are very close? Uh, same answer. Is it cash versus accrual? I mean, if they're very close, the problem is they may be very close. And if you have them both and they're very close, that's one thing. But the scenario you gave me was that in at least one of those years, you had the financial statements instead of the tax return. They can be close for a whole nother re reason if you're talking about the bottom line or top line revenue. So I'd use it if it supports everything and everything else looks good. I'd just be aware that this is a potential area where you can be thrown off. All right, so Meredith is gonna be talking about conversations and conversations are the critical piece, I believe, uh, to making sure that the, all the information you're getting, that you understand it by asking the borrower. And I would throw in that conversations are also the way that you cement your relationship with the borrower. So good conversations in tax return analysis turn into good conversations to develop business. So Meredith, what are you doing next week? Well, you pretty much hit the, hit the nail on the head of what I'm going to do, but I want to say, I want to, I want to make um, one comment um, about what you discussed today, because I think it is so powerful. I mean, the nutshell, really what I'm taking away is that, you know, it's our job as those who look at tax returns to look at them to ask questions. 
you know, so often they come through, we're just running the numbers and not looking for, for, for what isn't right. Years ago, when I was taught to be a lender and see Connie McSwain on here, she'll remember Brian Mansfield, a our credit analyst, who taught me that tax returns are the story of the person. And really get in there and, and figure that out and ask the questions. And then when I think about, you know, last week we had Tracy saying, when we talk to somebody or we look at somebody, these are the signals and clues that we're looking for. Then Linda, today you gave us what's on the paper that we ought to be asking questions with. And with all that information, that rolls into my webinar, which is going to be great. We know there's a problem. We know there's a challenge. We know there's something off kilter, but what an awkward conversation. How do we do that, especially for most of us who aren't in massively large communities? Somebody could be somebody's uncle, brother, sister, cousin, and you have to go back and have that conversation to probe to see if there's a problem or not and still maintain the relationship. So that's what we're going to be doing next week is wrapping all three of these together and saying, now that you suspect, now that you have questions, now that you're between that rock and a hard place, how do you handle this so delicately? How do you master that art of conversation that if you're right, then you've done what you need to do to protect the bank and your customer. And if you're wrong, you've still done it in a way that leaves everybody their dignity, respect, and allows the relationship to move forward. So that's what we're going to be doing um, next week. But I got to say, in listening to you today and thinking about Tracy's webinar, I think when this is over, I'm going to go watch all three together because I think that's, if I, can, if I can watch the recordings back to back, it's really going to give me what I need to make sure that, you know, I'm dotting all my I's and crossing, crossing my T's. So um, uh, we hope that you will join us um, here uh, next week, um, same time, same place. A different webinar. I am going to send the recording out. And Tracy and Linda, you want to jump in and um, say anything before we jump off? I do. I've just chatted in, and but I'm also going to share my screen and be sure that you have the URL um, to get a red flags yes. report. And Great. this is um, where I went through my two 200 plus page manuals on tax return analysis. And every place I had a little icon that was a red flag or a warning or a watch floor, I then pulled it into this report, a 20 page excerpt from the full manuals. And it's totally focused on what we've been talking about, what should get your attention, but also when there is a green light explanation for it, um, giving you that as well. So that is in the chat, but for those of you watching the recording, I know you don't get to see the chat. So here is the URL that you need. And then Tracy, how about you? Well, I have to go here. I actually have a meeting at the Federal Reserve Bank down in Denver, oh. and I'm gonna drive as fast as I can to get there. But here's the deal. If anybody didn't see last week, or you don't know who I am, I'm a body language expert, um, just email me and I'll be happy to um, send you the link because Meredith was really kind and uploaded it. And so my email, it's going to be in the chat box right now. It's Tracy at tracybrown.com. And um, I would be happy to um, send you that, that link. So with that, I'm going to sign off and right. um, we'll see everybody next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. I, and I'm just going to close out by, um, by saying if you're not connected to Linda or Tracy, find them on social networking, shoot them a link, follow their blogs, follow their social networking. There's a lot of really great information um, going on there. I'll make sure everybody gets the link from today's uh, uh, webinar, and we'll see you here um, next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.